So Timothy James Lekine is a professor of history whose work focuses on the ways in which the new material humanism can help us to better understand the past and future of humans and the planet. His latest book, The Matter of History, How Things Create the Past, develops a bold theoretical and methodological approach that emphasizes the many ways, ways in which a dynamic material environment creates humans, both as biological and cultural creatures. Challenging the conventional lines drawn between human culture and nature, he argues we are best understood as indecipably material creatures whose intelligence and creativity arise from our engagement with the dynamic things around us, not in distinction to them. He has published numer numerous articles, reviews, and given many invited lectures around the world, including China, South Africa, Chile, England, Sweden, Germany, Austria, Norway, and the Czech Republic. In 2017, he was a senior visiting fellow at the Oslo Center for Advanced Study, where he collaborated with the Nor Norwegian archeologist and theorist Bjorn Olsen uh, in the project After Discourse, investigating ways of moving beyond the postmodern culture, uh, cultural turn. From 2011 to 2012, Lekain was a senior fellow at the Rachel Carlson Center in Munich, Germany a global center for the study of the envi environmental humanities. In 2018, he returned as a visiting scholar to RCC, and Lekain is currently a professor of history at Montana State University in Bosman, Montana, where he lives with his wife and two children, as well as a constantly growing menagerie of companion animals. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, that's much appreciated. Um, let's make sure I'm all checked out. Top is forward. OK, good. All right, well, again, um, thank you. I wanted to you know, particularly uh, uh, thank Roberto, uh, Philippe, um, for inviting me, for Lucy, to Lucy for all her help in, in the arrangements. Um, it's great to be here, and I thought, well, this is going to be very different than my usual type of uh, academic talk. I smell paint in the air. There are material artifacts all around us. We had a lovely session this morning with Philippe's class about how materialities can spark agency or creativity or diamond, dynamism, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, and that's the way I felt when Roberto first contacted me about doing this. Um, as you already know, I'm mostly an environmental historian, um, but I've thought for a long time um, that the profession of environmental history really needed to take interior spaces much more seriously than it generally has. Um, that neglect seemed to me to be a huge problem, given that the vast majority of people actually spend most of their time inside. Uh, rather than outside. Um, but environmental history pretty much emerged from the environmental movement in the 1970s. And so for many years it was focused mostly on what we would today call nature, conventional ideas of nature. That is national parks, forests, rivers, that's a, that sort of thing. As the field matured, environmental historians did pay more attention to the built environment. Um, especially cities, and there was even some discussion of interior spaces, but it was mostly like um, offices, mobile homes. But even when they did talk about interior spaces, it was almost always about the pollutants and toxins uh, that occurred in those spaces. Um, you know, off-gassing carpets, uh, plywood that releases formaldehyde into the atmosphere, et cetera. So all that was really important, but it seemed to me way too, way too limited. So a few years ago, it did occur to me, I don't know why it took me so long, that maybe environmental historians could benefit by drawing on the ideas of architects uh, and architectural historians. So we could better understand the way that environments shape who we are in all our dimensions. Sorry, I've got mine actually all written out here, so. There we go. 
So really today I'm here honestly hoping that I might learn as much from you all as you might learn from me. At least that's my hope and I think I'm, I already have. And as the title of my talk suggests, I'm particularly interested in thinking about um, the environmental or ecological issues in terms of the categories of interior and interiority. In other words, how do interior spaces and the things and organisms uh, within them help to shape the interiority of the human subject, of the human mind and body? That is to say, cognition, mind, and the broader society and culture. Um, obviously, the concept of an interior implies the existence of a separate exterior. Um, just like the interiority of a human mind or consciousness seems to suggest its separation from the exterior world. But as, as <clears throat> Roberto and Philippe and others have said in my own work, which I try to fuse environmental history with what they call the new materialism or neo-materialism, to try to push back against those sorts of separations. And I've become increasingly convinced that we need to to escape, as Roberto was already suggesting, the long-standing anthropocentrism of our species and of our disciplines, particularly the humanities, and better recognize and analyze the ways in which thought, intelligence, and creativity are, at least in part, uh, generated by our intimate interactions with a vibrant material world, pencils, glass, etc. So my own approach draws pretty heavily on humanistic theories, new materialism, but I think one of the more exciting things that's happening right now are all the new scientific insights that uh, Philippe has already uh, referred to briefly. Uh, the science of the human microbiome, that 1.1 kilograms of bacteria that uh, we carry around within us that at least at some level shapes how we think, how we feel. Um, but there are others. I'm particularly fascinated by the recent socio-ecological concept of human niche construction. This is a theory that also undermines conventional distinctions between the brain and body and environment. It argues that humans, like all organisms, create niches, uh, which in turn serve to create, sustain, and define who we are. The science of epigenetics is another fascinating uh, change. This offers evidence that the old nature versus nurture or matter versus culture debate was just wrong-headed. Both scientists and historians should understand the role of genetics in human physiological and cognitive processes as a product of development. In other words, we're not just products of our genes, but rather those genes interacting with the environments that we're currently in, that we uh, grow in and come to age in. Finally, a small but growing number of contemporary uh, cognitive scientists and theorists now argue that the human mind is not confined to our skulls, but, or even our bodies, but rather is extensive, this idea of extended cognition with the surrounding environment. Andy Clark is the most prominent uh, advocate of this extended mind thesis. He suggests that human cognitive abilities are distributed in a network of external props and aids, things like notes, maps, and files. Clark says, when we change our phys physical environment, we also reconfigure our minds and our capacities of thought and reason. So those are just some of the theories I'm drawing on. I could go on at that. But I'd be the first to admit, because I've tried it, <laughs> that it's easier to talk about... Pardon? Oh, down. Oh. oh, there we go. Yes, all right. It's easier to talk about these things, to theorize them, than it is to actually put them, put them into action. Um, I tried to do it in this book here. I, I thought I made a game effort at it. For example, I argued that maybe we need to think about the copper wires um, within our walls as 
powerful material things for forming the modern consciousness. Um, the interiority um, or transcendence of kind of abstract culture that we live in uh, today. I also studied Japan. I was very interested there in uh, silkworms. That was what that section was about. And in the silkworms, which the Japanese make a practice of actually bringing into their homes, or at least they did in the 19th century, as you can see, as you can see here. So they bring these into their home, these metamorphic uh, caterpillars, who, if left to their own devices, would eventually turn into moths, of course. Of course, they're not. They're, they're stopped at the stage of the cocoon in order to extract the silk. Um, but I, I wanted to understand what living with those insects might have done to the Japanese, how it might have formed their mind, their cognition, the way they looked at the world. So I speculated, I'll admit it's a bit speculative. And certainly there are other causalities. But I suggested that the intimacy of that contact with these insects contributed to a new Japanese interiority. They granted both confidence and technical abilities to help transform Japan into a major world power within just a few decades. I'd be happy to discuss any of those more if people want to ask about them. Um, but today, I want to move on and focus more tightly on some of my new thinking uh, regarding the concept of walls, exteriors, interiors. Um, the boundaries that we try to erect between those. My new book project is, at least tentatively, uh, called The Age of Immaterialism. So what I want to argue in that book is that one of the central aspects, but largely overlooked aspects of the modern world, is this extraordinary immaterialism. That is, the ever-increasing distancing of humans from the material world. So to develop that argument, and this is what I'm going to try to talk to you about today, I'll draw on the work of some other uh, recent scholarship. And one of the most exciting things since that book came out, and since new materialism began to develop, is how some younger scholars are really taking these ideas and developing them in uh, bold new ways. So I want to present some of those and then also talk about uh, some of my own recent work. All right, the first one, oh, those are the three I'm going to look at, uh, three types of walls. The Irish mud-walled cottage, the American cement-walled basement, and the steel-walled uh, automobile. So let's start with the first one, <clears throat> the Irish mud-walled cottage. Um, let's see. Oh, before I, yeah. Here we go. So here, what I'm drawing on, does that seem to pop out of fade every once in a while, or is it relatively st stable? You can all hear me okay? Okay, good. So here, I'm drawing on some recent work of a young scholar of Irish studies. Her name's uh, Colleen Taylor. And last spring, I and several other scholars were invited to Notre Dame University to discuss Taylor's uh, innovative new book manuscript, manuscript that's uh, tentatively titled Irish Materialisms. Uh, Taylor takes a new materialist approach to analyzing the British colonial oppression of the Irish in the 19th century. Taylor's work offers a useful model for how we can think about interior spaces created by what is perhaps the most seemingly mundane of building materials the mud that Irish peasants used to build their modest uh, thatch-roofed cottages. The beauty of Taylor's work, I think, lies in its exposure and explication of how the ideas, metaphors, and decisions that produced British colonialism had emerged in no small part from a patently twisted and modernist misreading of mud walls. So to recover the truth, and also the many contrary Irish materialities that gave them some ability to resist those false British metaphors, 
Taylor demonstrates how the researcher must interrogate both human texts and the real things, the things themselves. Taylor reframes the new materialism, thus, as a powerful methodology for recovering subaltern histories, the histories of often neglected groups and individuals. Though now is stories that are both human and non-human. In her analysis, the application of new materialist theory and methods become an act of resistance, resistance against discursive colonialist approaches. And that those approaches required and assumed that we would simply ignore the real Irish material environment of plants and animals and artifacts, which I would argue until Taylor's work was by and large the truth. But in her skilled retelling, those dismissive and racist British metaphors repeatedly are forced to confront the rich, multivalent nature of Irish things. Specifically, the British claim that the windowless, and here I'll have an image for you, this would be a typical Irish um, mud-walled cottage. The British argued that these cottages manifestly demonstrated the inferior animalistic state of the Irish peasantry. This abstracted and largely immaterial reading of mud walls thus became a justification for harsh colonial uh, suppression and control. Taylor, however, confronts that British immaterialism with the genuine ecological utility of living dirt walls and the interior spaces they created. Taylor points out that the porous living walls, uh, living soil that were in the walls, were in fact an effective countermeasure against the growth of bacterial and fungal mold, which you would expect in a humid climate uh, like Ireland. It allowed fresh air to circulate <clears throat> through the soil and keep the otherwise tightly enclosed interior air freshened. The considerable mass of the mud walls also acted as a heat sink, holding the warmth of the central hearth long after the fire had gone out. Unlike the brick and slate houses that were popular with the British and the supposedly elevated classes in Ireland, which also required mining and transportation from other regions, these interior spaces were generated by a relatively simple rearrangement of the materials in the immediate environment, um, an environment that the Irish knew well, soil, straw, and thatch. So these simple things empowered the peasants through local, easily accessed resources. The mud wall cottage also offered a welcoming space for the non-human. Non-human guests, such as the invaluable domesticated Irish pig. Keeping pigs inside during cold nights not only protected these valuable and congenial animals, but provided the Irish humans a useful resource of heat and companionship. Again, the British colonialists had argued that the Irish practice of living with what they viewed as bestial and dirty pigs was evidence of Irish inferiority. But Taylor confronts rhetorical abstraction with the material reality of these mammals who gave the Irish farmer warmth, affection, and sustenance. And thus, also, at some level, the hope and strength uh, to resist their British overlords. In sum, Taylor reconfigures the walls and interior spaces of the Irish mud-walled cottage as a materially powerful means of challenging British colonialism. A colonialism which was in part founded on the false modernist divisions that we've been talking about. In this sense, Anglo-centric arrogance is revealed as a subcategory of a broader anthropocentric arrogance. One which seeks to wall off the modern civilized human world from a material world that it frames as inferior, barbarous, and dangerous. The interior of the Irish cottage 
thus becomes a critical generator of an Irish interiority of self-sufficiency, pride, and resistance. All right, my next example, the American cement walled basement. So if the 19th century Irish mud walled cottage fostered a porous, multi-species and creative interior environment, my next example more clearly reflects a more elitist and modernist drive to use walls to separate humans from all of those. In the first half of the 20th century, the British and Americans pioneered a new building material I think you're all familiar with, that sought to be the opposite, pretty much, of Taylor's wild mud walls. This was, of course, the new technology of cement, which, when mixed with gravel, becomes concrete. As one of my current doctoral students, uh, Kirk Anderson, argues in his dissertation, modern cement has been a material of building apart, of dividing and sealing spaces. In contrast with the poorish mud walls, Irish mud walls, the cement of the early 20th century was remarkable for its impermeability. Almost nothing, water, air, dirt, insects, could penetrate a well-made cement wall. Given this, Anderson argues that cement walls helped to generate and solidify one of the defining features of modernity, the idea that humans were both literally and metaphorically se separated from the non-human world. Cement, in this sense, offered an impermeability in service to immateriality. Most intriguingly for our purposes here, though, Anderson examines the role of cement in creating one of the most archetypal of modern American interior spaces, which is to say, uh, the basement. Here we have the basement beautified. <clears throat> Prior to the development of cement, most Americans had been loath to spend significant amounts of time living underground. Of course, many people had cellars for the storage of food and other materials, but these were, as you can see in the quote on this slide, uh, these were um, seen as damp and disorderly places, which is to say they were too wild and too difficult to bound and control, somewhat akin, perhaps, in, in, a, in a lineage with the British colonialist disdain for Irish mud-walled cottages. Americans also framed close contact with dirt, moisture, insects, and other organisms as backwards and lower class. Middle or upper class status depended on enforcing the same elitist or colonialist lines of separation. To this end, the new cement walled basements kept out water, odor, spiders, and more creating comfortable rooms, which in turn helped to generate novel ways of living associated with the post-war nuclear family. Anderson argues that as simply as, you know, at one level you can see it simply as an additional room, the basement furthered the well-known post-war cultivation and curation of an individual identities. But Anderson suggests that perhaps the most original creativity sparked by cement walls were the brightly lit and colorful recreational rooms that many Americans, myself included, spent our teenage years in. These interior spaces were largely removed from the functionality and work and instead fostered a sense of escape, entertainment, and embrace of something a little bit more trivial. In the new age of nuclear bombs and radioactivity, the strength and relative impermeability of the cement basement could also offer the hope that the family might even survive a nuclear attack. The interior of Anderson's cement lined basement recreational room thus helped to both generate and protect <clears throat> to generate and protect the interiority of the burgeoning new age of immaterialism. And of course, finally, 
<coughs> the steel-walled automobile. So let me finish by turning now to some of my own more recent research and what I argue might well be one of the most transformative interiors of the 20th century, which is to say the interior of the modern automobile. To be sure, not all citizens of the globe shared in the transformative age of the automobile. Yet, as Roland Barthes observed, even those who did not personally own or experience the automobile were often affected by its image and its presence. Quoting Barthes, I think that cars today are almost the exact equivalent of the great Gothic cathedrals. I mean, the supreme creation of an era, conceived with passion by unknown artists and considered and consumed in image, if not in usage, by a whole population, which appropriates them as a purely magical object. I like that idea of magical. With a car, we encounter an interior that is obviously different than the conventional idea of an architectural space, like an Irish cottage or a cement basement. Yet the interior of a car bears some resemblance to both in its attempt to wall off the individual, the individual driver and passengers. This walling off was not entirely new, of course. Horse-drawn coaches did something similar. Although critically, the driver of such a coach was often separated from the passengers by riding on top rather than inside. The locomotive-powered passenger train also ensconced humans in a tightly bounded uh, interior space. But here, too, the engineer operator was distinct from the passive passengers who were literally simply along for the ride. In this light, the development of the mass-produced, personally-driven automobile in the 20th century I would argue, occasion an extraordinarily new and transformative interior space, one in which the passenger was also the engineer, though now renamed the more prosaic driver. True, there were transitional automobile technologies like the convertible, in which the interior space could quickly be transformed into an exterior space and backwards. But as we've seen with the precipitous decline in sales of the convertible since the 1960s, uh, the enclosed modern automobile is by far and away the dominant uh, technology. So the modern demise of the popular convertible was in part a result of another consequence of these extraordinary interior spaces, which was just the sheer speeds with, with which the automobile, uh, which the automobile can attain. On post-war superhighways and autobahns, where drivers routinely travel at 120 kilometers per hour or much more, such breathtaking speeds were in turn facilitated by the material nature of the steel walls that surrounded the car passenger compartment. Made from sheet metal, these sculpted steel walls are amazingly strong and impervious and capable of being so tightly sealed that the interior climate of the modern car is nearly as controlled as Anderson's post-war cement-lined basement. Likewise, this novel interior space becomes a place where drivers and passengers were immersed in an array of new synthetic materials. Prior to the 1950s, the interiors of cars were dominated by the same materials that would be found in household interior, interior fur, furnishings, which is to say leather, uh, wood, natural fibers. But in the post-war period, manufacturers began to replace these traditional materials with various forms of plastics, foam rubber, synthetic fibers, chemical adhesives. Indeed, in walling the passenger off from the exterior environment, the post-war automobile generated an interior in which the air was impregnated with volatile gases, 
which as my colleague Arwen Mohan has argued, ironically became valued as that so-called new car smell. At least it is in the United States. I don't know if it is in, in, in Europe as much. Few, if any, anticipated at the time that those smells would later be categorized as potential toxins that could literally enter into the human body and brain with potentially dangerous health consequences. And in that sense, it sort of recalls the contemporary, contemporaneous warnings of Rachel Carson when she pointed out that DDT, nuclear um, radioisotopes, could also enter into the human bodies in ways that we simply couldn't, we couldn't easily escape. So once again, it reveals the challenges of truly separating ourselves from an ever surprising and arguably creative material world. So where then might we put the steel walls, steel walled interior of the car on the spectrum of mud walls and cement basements? If mud walls engendered sociocultural divisions of British imperialism and Irish resistance, and cement walls generated an increasingly abstracted and immaterialist mid-century American nuclear family, what sort of interiority might arise from the interior of a car? Well, I'm still thinking about that, but I suspect, or I would argue, that it is the very type of culture and society that the themes of this conference, I think, are meant to challenge. That is, a society that believes it can transcend, transcend time and space, wall itself off from the rest of the planet. This will to transcendence becomes all the more apparent, apparent once we add in the obvious distinction between a car and an Irish cottage or a cement basement. The ease with which a small movement of the right foot can send these thousands of pounds of metal and plastic rocking across the landscape at speeds that would have been incomprehensible even half a century ago. As Rudolf Repetti notes in a recent essay, Vitesse, and here I put the French up here because I'm going to slaughter it, <coughs> but nonetheless, La Vitesse, Repetti can, argues, est toujours proche de l'enfer. It's a forbidden fruit that gives humans a supernatural power and consciousness. La vitesse est facteur de immatérialité et elle permet d'échapper à une forme de l'odeur que nous est inhérente. Plaisant physiquement dans une situation où les temps, l'espace sont perçus en dehors des contingences, va abolir. Indeed, la vitesse nous projette dans un monde abstrait. A car, and Repetti uses this illustration to, to sort of capture this. The car projects the driver into the ethereal realm of the gods, as with Apollo and his heavenly chariot. But despite its drive towards transcendence through speed, the open convertible shown here still maintained a powerful element of engagement with the exterior world, with its smells and sounds and weather. In this sense, the further elevation of the human driver to their godlike, godlike status, this Cadillac, was only fully realized when sheet metal walled them off from any contact with that mundane material world, other than through that most abstracted of human senses, the view through the glass windows. With the modern car, we don't enter into interior spaces so much as we wear it like a suit of clothes. We carry our interior spaces with us, the car even substitutes its mechanisms for our legs and lungs, and perhaps, too, its way of thinking for our own way of thinking. The irony here is that in reality, steel sheet metal is one of the more 
impermanent of human materials because it so easily rusts. Moreover, the particular interior and interiority of the car is held in place only by the profligate consumption of oil, a reminder that our machines, like our homes, always entangle us with greater natural forces than we often wish to recognize. Ironically, despite this reliance on non-human material things, steel, plastic, and oil, the interior space of the automobile may well be the single most powerful generator of an immaterialist human interiority of disconnection, hubris, and self-aggrandizement. And I have a little more, but I'll end there so we have time for questions and answers. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions or comments or... I, I did have to say before, but uh, part of the program are two students that just will be asking questions. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, could you please explain a bit more about what you said about the silk worm influencing the Japanese people into becoming more powerful economically, please? Okay, sure. Thank uh, you. Right. Well, right. The argument is, a, it's a little, maybe my presentation of it here today was a little bit misleading, although I do think the, the act of actually bringing the silkworm into the home was critical to this. But part of that intimate contact went even deeper, and perhaps it did emerge, at least in part, from that close contact with the silkworms. But was the deliberate breeding of the silkworm? In other words, selective breeding, they would find certain traits, which they would then breed uh, silkworms with similar, um, well, they'd have to let them become moss before they can breed, obviously but that had sim similar traits that they wanted because what I argue is much of the creativity of silk is actually has to be credited to the silkworm themselves. In other words, humans can't really deliberately change the way that silkworms synthesize silk. All they can do is kind of selectively breed for them, which is what they did. But that became a very sophisticated process in Japan where they tightly controlled the eggs and there were brokers who would be set up to move the eggs around Japan and make sure you were getting certain colors or, or um, textures of the silk. And so what I'm sort of arguing is, one, that sense of control, that you could actually do that, that humans could actually do this, gave the Japanese a sense of possibility and just the simple technological ability, right? The, uh, the managerial and technological infrastructure that went into it uh, was also essential for the development of sort of modern Japan. But I still would come back to the argument that it's that intimate contact with the silkworm themselves in the home that leads to all of that. So you can see it at least as a starting place uh, for Japanese modernization. Is there Uh, thank you. Um, I've read in, the, in your website uh, a sentence that I would like to talk about with you. Uh, you said that organism, machines, buildings, and countless other artifacts, these are the non-human things that makes us human. What do you mean exactly by us human in those relationships? And maybe that's something that you explained a bit today, but with one of the examples that you brought, maybe you could uh, specify a bit more about this. Sure. Sure. So I think it's, it's, it is something that uh, Roberto and Philippe have already been talking about, which is sort of escaping the conventional anthropocentrism that is dominated in the modern world for a number of centuries, at, at, at the very least. Um, not in the sense of just making humans more humble, although I do argue for that, that that would probably be a, a better way to proceed than what we've done up until this point. Um, it's that arrogance and that 
that anthropocentrism, I argue, that has gotten us into the position we're in right now. But more than that, <clears throat> if you really embrace this idea that there is no human subject that is entirely interior to our bodies, but rather that humans as individuals and societies are emergent and always changing based on the environment in which they live, that's the simplest and most straightforward explanation for what I meant there, right? You, you are, we are, in at least some small way, at this very moment, becoming different because we're in this room, sitting on these chairs, having this conversation, of course, but this physical environment is having some small effect on us. And if you take that broadly to encompass all the material things that we live with constantly throughout the course of our lives, that that is, in fact, what it means to become human. We, we through that embrace, that interaction. And it maybe wasn't clear in the discussion, but so it's probably worth, worth clarifying right now. I see that moment as, as a fusion. Right at any moment, you're carrying certain social and cultural and political values with you. You're carrying a certain body, a certain brain, a certain um, cognition, a certain physiology. But when you bring that to bear against the material world, whatever it is, whether somebody was talking about dogs this morning in their project, right? A place where dogs, when you interact with the dog, you become different, right? The dog has an effect on you. So it's not determinative. A dog will have a different effect on you than it will have on me, depending on what, what we've done, where we've been, what kind of life, we've, life that we have had. Um, but the dog still matters, right? The dog is an extraordinarily powerful creature, or an Irish pig. So that's what I was trying to get at, or what um, uh, Dr. Taylor was trying to get at with the Irish pig. Well, you know, it wasn't just the Irish who came up with the strength and the idea and the ability to finally fight back against their colonial oppressors. It was their pig, too. And their pig helped them to do that. So that's what I mean. That's how we become most human in, in good ways and bad, right? The car, I'll be frank, honestly, I love cars. And I don't think you're ever going to get rid of cars until you understand why humans love cars. What is it that they do for us? You won't be able to find ways to solve the problems the automobile have, has created unless you understand what they can do for us, why we treasure them so much. But what does it do for us? Well, it tends to engender a kind of dangerous individualism. Right, sort of a dangerous will to power. We need to think about that. We need to make selections. We need to figure out, you guys, really, you designers, you know, what kind of environments will make the kind of people that you think we need to become. So to me, that's really exciting. It's another tool. Instead of just trying to change people's minds, to talk to them, to convince them to think differently, you have the power perhaps, to change people by the kinds of places that they live in. I think that's very exciting and in a, in an extraordinarily new and powerful tool that we can bring to bear to answer the questions uh, that this conference is, is trying to engage. That was actually my conclusion, so I got to do it anyway. Any other questions? Are we out of time? Oh, sure. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, okay. Maybe uh, just a, a sm very small uh, question about uh, uh, what do you think about the, in, uh, with what's happened today, it's like, um, because there is, there, there is some material problem today, you know, from the CO2, from the or, or natural problem also for with the COVID-19. So th this is, th there is a rise of material problem 
And maybe, of course, there is still social and political problem, but there is some uh, new material problem that are arriving in our, in our time. And so, what do you think about, because m m what I understand, it's like the, the reaction of the intellectual community is more to extend the politics to the nature. And, uh, but in, in a certain way, um, this is like to extend more the anthropocentric uh, point of view on the nature, to say that, okay, nature should come also into the law, the human law, and in the jurisdiction of the human, and so, like, to extend the, the anthropocene to the non-human. And, uh, but what, what's happened, it's more that the nature is coming to transform uh, the, the society, and uh, this is a little what you explained, that the material we are using and uh, we, are, we have access to certain material is transforming the type of, uh, of space and also transforming the civilization. So, uh, what do you think about the kind of, um, is it correct to extend the culture to the nature, or should we not, in a certain way, accept to extend the nature to the culture instead of, uh, of that. What do you, Ada? Right. Well, I do think, um, thanks, Philippe, uh, that definitely one of the, um, of the many interesting, exciting insights that I think a scientist, wildlife biologists, and others have made in recent years is to say or to argue that other animals do have culture. That used to be pretty much forbidden, right? Most wildlife biologists would never say that, you know, elephants have culture. Now it's actually becoming fairly common to think of other animals as having culture. I know that's not quite what you were asking, but literally they do. And so when we think about our interactions with at least fairly um, sentient advanced uh, animals, it is a meeting of cultures. We are actually meeting another culture um, with dogs as well, very sophisticated animals. Um, but am I extending culture in the sense of human culture to them? Yeah, I guess so, but not in the sense I want to export all of the analytical tools that we have for human culture and somehow bring it to bear on the non-human world. Mm, I think I'm more interested in the way that there is that moment of culture that emerges from our interaction with them. And it goes both ways, too. The animals, too, will change. The animals' culture, if you will, will change because of their interactions with us. This morning we saw the um, interesting presentation on cows, right? The, the classic Swiss um, uh, bronze, right? The, the brown cow. You look at an animal like that, and they obviously have been radically changed by their interaction uh, with, with human beings. I'd be curious to know, though, and what I would have asked of the presenter was, well, how has the cow's culture changed? How, how do they look at human beings? How can we try to begin to get at that? I think there are the tools now that we can actually do this. We can actually begin to find out what they're thinking, and those are only going to get stronger as we as we proceed. But no, I think more it's, at least from a, I am a humanist, right, historian. By definition, I really do kind of look at human beings. Um, so I'm more interested in what this can tell us about ourselves, but we have to look outside of ourselves to see ourselves most clearly, I think. I don't know if I really answered your question, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you.